Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, welcome to the video. Today's video is uh, the second in my series called One Album Only. And the idea here is that um, if the house, you know, goes up in flames or there's going to be a flood or there's something, some other horrible, horrible event, and I've got a few minutes to run into my music room and grab a, one of the best albums, that my favorite albums from a whole series of artists and bands, which album would I rescue? So the first video I did was on uh, Johnny Mitchell, and this one is on the band Yes. Now, when I do these videos, what I tend to do is, rather than just come on camera and say, in two minutes flat, um, this is the, uh, these are the albums I don't like, and this is the best one. Go buy it. I don't do that. What I do is I actually go through the whole catalog, listen to everything that I've got, and then kind of reacquaint myself with, you know, what the highs and lows of their careers are, and then come to a, I like to think, a considered decision as to which album would I rescue. But the problem when you're dealing with a band like Yes, who've been going since... 68, 69 or something like that, um, is that it's exhausting, absolutely exhausting. I mean, I should have checked up on how many studio and live albums they'd released over the years, but I've not really got down to doing that. But it's a lot. So by the time you get to the end of listening to, in chronological order, the albums, um, you're exhausted. And you kind of forget, it kind of washes over you and you kind of forget, well, what was particularly good about that album versus this other album 20 years later? And how do you direct people who aren't so familiar with the music? Maybe newcomers or people looking at the vast catalog and thinking, where the hell do I start? How do you direct people in the, into um, uh, you know, selecting from a handful of the, of the catalog uh, um, and give them some reasons to do so? So I... I'm absolutely pig sick of listening to Yes over the last it's more than a few weeks. And so I've been meaning to do this video for ages, but I thought oh, today I've got to get it done. Otherwise, I'm going to go out of my mind. Um, so what I did, uh, in addition to listening at all, and I thought, well, what I'll do, I'm, I'll put some notes together to help steer me through this video when I eventually got around to doing it. So I've got some notes here that I'm, um, I'm going to draw on as... Um, as, as I go through these albums and then choose the, the best one. So let me just clean the lens here. I think I've just noticed something that's a little bit dirty. There you go. All right. Okay. So as I say, second in the series. Um, well, first, quest, first question. And maybe put it in the comments. Who is the most important member of Yes in all those years? Who is the most important member and why? Put something in the comments if you like. Anyway, so second in the series, my aim is to pick out the one album I'd hold on to from a series of artists whose music I love and admire, but don't necessarily subscribe to the whole of their catalogue. So if Yes is your favourite band of all time and you expect a comprehensive rundown of Yes's albums from worst to best, then you probably should look elsewhere because they're not my favorite band, even though I've been buying records by this band since 1972 stroke 1973. So if you're comfortable listening to someone who's been buying and listening to Yes up for all those years and happy to hear recommendations, then stick around. So, so for viewers of this channel, it's no secret that I started buying music in 1972 and quickly gravitated to Genesis with their Selling England by the Pound album. And that opened the doors to me to progressive rock. In fact, it actually moved me on from listening to Roy Wood and Status Quo into something that was kind of more adventurous and, and, and certainly more interesting. So I, I was soon buying albums by Bartley James Harvest, Emerson Lake and Palmer, Pink Floyd, and Yes, as well as multiple cheap compilations that were around at the time. So I first came across Yes, um, in the Age of Atlantic compilation, I'm going to do a video on my top 10 compilation albums and the Age of Atlantic will be uh, uh, amongst them. And that had, um, in addition to Led Zeppelin, it had uh, Survival um, on it by Yes. So what was intriguing about these bands 
is that they all sounded very different from each other. You know, yes, Jethro Tull, Emerson Lincoln Palmer, and Bob, despite being labeled as prog, they were all kind of distinctive. Uh, and also with this genre, um, you, don't, you don't get the albums on the first, second, or third listen. You have to get into the music. Remember when we used to sit in our bedrooms, um, get a piece of bit of peace and quiet from the rest of the family and sit there maybe with headphones on and just try and concentrate on these albums and you know go through the the um the the discomfort of thinking oh, i don't like this it's rubbish i'm, I'm gonna listen to it again because you've got to get into it that's that's like the way prog prog rock was in, in those days so as i said those early listening sessions often torturous not enjoyable other than being in the knowledge that the music would eventually get under my skin uh, and maybe provide years of enjoyment afterwards. Amongst all of the prog bands I was beginning to listen to, Yes were one of the most difficult, at least initially. Because I think their music, Yes's music, is it's complex, it's dense, and yet it's still kind of melodic. And uh, even in the, um, I say even in the early stuff, they've always been melodic. Uh, and they've got, I'll talk about their influences as I understand them. So at the time, and it might still be be the case is that if someone, you know, sits me in a on a stool, you know, in the mastermind chair and say, "Well, come on, then uh, do give us a history of prog rock." Um, my baseline is probably Genesis because it's just kind of the stuff that resonated most strongly with me in the early years, and I stuck with it. So what struck me most about the difference between Genesis and Yes was that Genesis music was easier to digest seemingly less stuffed with instruments playing all at the same time. So let me explain. Early Genesis influenced mostly by classical composers. And I think uh, Tony Banks, the keyboard player uh, uh, for, um, for Genesis, was classically trained. Uh, and, and I'm not sure the other ones were, by the way. But And the main members were, I mean, I said they were privately educated. Kind of, they're all a bit like stuffy and all that sort of stuff. And... Uh, at least until Collins and Steve Haggard arrived, um, joining for their third album, Nursery Crime. Banks had enormous sway over this kind of symphonic prog palette of this, uh, this method that they were, they were developing. And actually, uh, Banks is, is well known for being dominant in the band. Um, one of the most stubborn, probably the most stubborn character, I think by his own admission, stubborn character. So he got his way a lot, influenced what was going on. But because Banks was classically trained and they drew upon symphonic classical influences, they were, um, there, there wasn't really, and I'll struggle anywhere in their catalogue to say this was influenced by jazz. Yes, though, by contrast, also had some of those classical influences, but importantly, jazz too. So on the earlier albums, you know, Yes and Time in a Word, uh, the Yes album maybe, uh, you can hear in part Steve Howe, the guitarist, playing in the style of the jazz guitarist Wes Montgomery. Um, this kind of nice, smooth picking and everything. Really, really nice, really accessible, in fact. But I think what, what that said to me anyway is that both bands were um, approaching progressive rock music from slightly different di directions and that ended up showing up in their music. Moreover, it was evident that Yes band members were virtuosos. Maybe not at right the very beginning, but the classic lineup, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they were masters of their instruments. So Steve Howe, very accomplished guitarist, capable of great creativity. And I think, is it Chet Atkins he cites as one of his big influences? I don't quite see the connection because I'm not uh, familiar that much with uh, Chad Atkins uh, guitar playing, but how is, is is very very capable. Bill Bruford, the drummer, of course, who then later joined King Crimson, is one of the most skilled and revered rock drummers. And then he in the eighties, of course, he morphed into his own jazz band, Earthworks, I think it is. Uh, classically trained, that that again, Rick Wakeman on keyboards. He'd already played with David Bowie on Hunky Draw, Donkey Dory, and um, his flamboyant keyboard skills would be enough to hold an audience for the duration of a full concert in the years to come. And he's been, you know, I saw him a couple of times in the 70s as a solo artist with his own band, and he's still doing that today. A good friend of mine saw him just a couple of months ago playing Birmingham Symphony Hall um, one more time. Uh, bassist Chris Squire, um, he kind of 
seem to me refuse to take a have a backup role. You know, he plays Rickenbacker, very melodic and loud bass guitar. Uh, I've said before, he kind of almost fights for the melody line in places. So he's he, he's kind of he's very very prominent. He's not just doing the uh, you know the low notes as it were. And singer John Anderson had an unusual but highly engaging high tone voice, key player in lyric writing and arranging. So um, I'm going to show an album in a minute. So I'm getting through this preamble. Forgive me. Um, when we're young, music. When we're young music lovers, we often see rock groups as kind of bands of brothers, and imagine them living together and traveling to gigs crammed into the back of their transit vans. The ones that don't fall out tend to grow all together, pursuing their their passion that started as a hobby and it's now it's it became a career. Few, of course, last the duration, uh, but yes, but and and of course, yes, have, but they never gave the impression, um, and and you know, deep yes fans might say might be able to cite periods when they were really were that band of brothers, but it always seemed to me as that they were a more of a, a collective, and if you look at through the 40, 50 year, 50 year career, you can see basically that. Uh, band members come and go and come back again and they've somehow managed to keep relationships reasonably good as i understand it but you know i know there's one or two have got um uh, grudges to bear or hold grudges um yeah the classic lineup of the early 70s split each member in turn pursuing solo and collaborative works you see that's why i need these notes before returning to the fold at this point at this point, with two of that classic lineup, uh, the classic lineup being after Bill Bruford left to join King Crimson, Alan White came in and was on the drum stool for decades. Um, with two of those now deceased, there remains only one member carrying the flag, um, and that's Steve Howe. And, and remarkably, they still sound like the same band. Um, just one more contrast to... Oh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Genesis again, so forgive me. Please be patient. As for Genesis, the overwhelming impression is that the demonstrations of virtuoso, virtuoso instrument playing was kind of frowned upon. Each musician was there to serve the needs of the song, even though a long guitar or keyboard solo might be the big hook for the song. The music kind of has more air space between the instruments and the clarity of the melody line certainly less congested than Yes's music. So Yes, a bit more difficult, lots going on, and especially with that Chris Choir bass guitar and the, um, the keyboard playing of Rick Wakeman where, you know, too many notes was never enough. It was, it's, the music was very, 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 very congested. And it seemed to me at times to be cacophonous with every instrument turned up high, the volume control turned up to 11. Very different, but still hugely enjoyable. So, which album would I grab in a fire? Well, let's start with the early albums, Yes and Time and a Word. So, here finally get to these two albums. Now, these two albums, you often find that the, um, the tracks on these albums appear on cheap compilations from time to time. So, there's different versions that somehow manage to escape the studio and end up on these cheap, cheap compilations. But these are two really, really enjoyable albums. It's not the classic lineup. Um, you've got John Anderson, Chris Squire, um, Bill Bruford on the on Time and a Word with um, Tony K on keyboards and Peter Banks on guitar. And it was the same here. Yeah, same here. Nice cover, nice album. Both these are really, really enjoyable. Now. There are a bit, um, there's, a, there's a few hints with that track Survival um, from the first album. There's a few hints that they're going to be able to, you know, a few hints of what their big, long epics that were going to come later were all about. So elsewhere, they're a bit forky, they're a bit jazzy or psychedelic. And so these albums are more than curios. You wouldn't start with either of those albums, but you wouldn't ignore these as Genesis fans ignore from Genesis to Revelation, their debut, and the last album they did, Calling All Stations. I find these enjoyable, dip into now and again, and they give an insight into how they were constructing pieces, starting the, to mold them into more complex arrangements. And they sound pretty good. Then we have the classic period. So what have we got here? Um, 
So the third album is the Yes album. Now this, now what have I said about this? Third album, major breakthrough. Nice cover too. Nice cover. Nice cover too. Sonically, it's outstanding. It's energetic. It's dynamic. It's a real step up on the previous ones. And it's fully formed. Classics like the, the opener, Yours is No Disgrace. Uh, I don't know what that means, by the way, but uh, Starship Trooper and I've seen all good people have remained regulars in their set lists uh, for the live shows that they're still doing. They're touring again this summer, so they're still out there. In particular, Yours is No Degrade, Disgrace leaps out of the speakers and announces itself with great drama. And it is. I mean, if, you, if I want exciting yes, I don't go to uh, the classic lineup. I go to Yours is No Disgrace and turn the volume up because it's just like, wow, what a band. What a fantastic opening track. Um, I don't, I don't know what Anderson's lyrics um, mean. Um, the one downside of this album is the inclusion of a live solo track from Steve Howe, which is called Clap, or The Clap, on this particular pressing here. Um, it's just him at the, the Lyceum in London. Yeah, live at Lyceum in London. Um, and this was released in 72. Um Recorded in 1970, at least part of it anyway. But um, yeah, the clap. I mean, it's just like just an acoustic piece. It's it's like a comedy piece. And this this was re and unfortunately this type of thing when it came on um, uh, came you know it went further on the next album, which I'll come to in a second. Um, so let's talk about that next album. So yeah, I definitely recommend this one. Is it the one I'm going to save in the fire? Maybe we shall see because it's got some fantastic tracks and it sounds brilliant. Um, unfortunately, this type of piece, the clap that is, um, was repeated in the follow-up album, Fragile, which is this one. Nice. Now, this is highly regarded by Yes fans. They love this album. And, of course, you've got Roger Dean covers beginning to appear here. And he was going to do a lot of their covers, which, of course, you know that. Otherwise, you wouldn't have got this far in the video. Um Unfortunately, it was repeated um, on this album. Basically, <laughs> my prejudice comes to the fore here. It's an opportunity for them to show off. People will have their favorites, but I don't credit any of these solo pieces. Every single band member we've got here, um, Rick Wakeman doing uh, some called Cans and Brahms, something about uh, from uh, adaptation of Brahms' Fourth Symphony. You've got... Um, 5% of Nothing, Bill Bruford, uh, Chris Squire does The Fish, Mooper a Day, Steve Howe. I can't remember whether it's Anderson does We Have Heaven. Um, maybe, maybe. But as I say, I, as I said at the beginning of this video, I'm kind of all yesed out at the minute. But I don't credit any of these pieces of being good enough to include on band albums. I just don't get it. Even though this is a very highly regarded album, I just think that it's a mess. Uh, sure, it includes Epic, the Epic Roundabout and Heart of the Sunrise, um, which are still in their live sets today, South Side of the Sky and Long Distance Runaround. Um, you know, Heart of the Sunrise and Roundabout are, are really justified classics. They're, they're a bit like yours is no disgrace. They are they are absolutely superb. Um, but it's no it's no wonder that the fans consider these among the band's best 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 ones. You know, it's normal still varying time signatures loud and quiet parts hold your attention really well and i think roundabouts usually the uh, the encore but the album is disjointed and has too many low points for the for the casual listener to contend with now if you're really really into yes you think oh that's great I, you know i like that little acoustic or keyboard interlude uh, even bill bruford's track here is worth worth, worth listening to but not for me it's not the album i'm going to save I, th I think you get that message don't you now, next, we just put this compilation yesterday's to one side. You then get to Close to the Edge, 1972. Considered to be one of the best progressive rock albums of all time. Might even be commonly voted as the number one of all time. So anyway, fourth album, Bonafide Classic. Top five prog albums, yeah, contains only three tracks. Uh, each one 
is right up there with the best of yes. So you've got the side long close to the edge, absolutely awesome. And you and I, and then Siberian Catru on side two. Um, they're all kind of like sweets. It, it kind of rocks hard in places, but it's delicate in others. And in, in terms of close to the edge, it actually climaxes beautifully with John Anderson's vocals, you know, kind of taking center stage, if, you know, forgive the cliche. There's a part of that song where he goes up and up and up and it, it, it's like, it's spine tingly. It's fantastic. It's justified classic. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that's close to the edge. Good album. Is that the one I'm going to save? Anyway, John Anderson was was in, interested in spirituality, and he might not have been alone, um, but I think he took charge of writing a lot of the lyrics for for the band, and particularly this next album, Tales from Topographic Oceans, this double album that came out in 1973. And I think he was influenced by uh, some spiritual guru called Parama, Paramahansa Yogananda, who was, um, I think he set up a meditation center, or a spiritual center in San Diego, Southern California anyway. And I've read his book. Uh, he wrote a book called Autobiography of a, of a Yogi. And that, the, the, the ideas ended up influencing the lyrics on this, on this double album. And this is basically double album with four tracks each one taking up a side and you'll know that already now um i don't know what the lyrics mean even though i've read the book i i, I just i mean someone's going to correct me in the comments here they're going to say well yeah you really underestimate john anderson's lyrics but that's just the way it is it does but it doesn't really matter to me the lyrics don't really matter because the music is full-on yes in epic mode um it's often regarded as overkill, you know, some sort of prog gone mad. It's overwrought. Uh, Rick Wakeman famously uh, doesn't like it. And maybe it was because it was a difficult album to make. But as a listener, I find the more that I listen to it, the more that I get out of it. Although none of the sides quite reach the level of close to the edge. Then they're, they're no slouches either. They are still great. Usual dynamic, loud, quiet, fast, slow, episodic suites. They're all worthy of paying attention to. And I like the album, as I say, the more that I hear it. So that's a, a good album. And then, of course, they released a triple, awful-sounding uh, live set um, with the same band. And then Rick Wakeman left. He'd had enough. Maybe the, he, he talks about um, Topographic Oceans as being, you know, a step too far. Um, maybe it was the tour that did, that, that did for him. And then Bill Bruford decided to jump off uh, the train as well, and then join um, Robert Fripp and King Crimson. Um, so he, Bruford was re replaced by Alan White, and Wakeman was re uh, replaced by Patrick Moraz. And he, 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 as far as I'm aware, he never wore a cape, and although he had long hair, it wasn't all the way halfway down his back. But and he wasn't as flamboyant, but I think with more of a jazz vibe in uh, in his keyboard playing rather than Wakeman's more classical stuff. Um, Real Air is kind of more challenging than a lot of the albums that have preceded it. Um, it's less melodic, it's more aggressive. It has got some places of real beauty in there. You know, you've got the section on Soon, uh, which is at the end of. Um, the Gates of Delirium and To Be Over is also uh, beautiful in, in places as well. Um, but it's got some kind of, well, there's one really weird bit where they, they chant cha-cha, cha-cha-cha, sort of something. I don't know what the hell that is all about. But anyway, Mraz influenced this album. He didn't hang around long enough for his personality to shine through beyond this. So it, it, what he did, came in, did one album, and then he was gone. Um, but still, this is a really good album. Really enjoy this album. Not the most melodic, as I've already said, but still great. That ended the period, you know, classic, yes, as I said. Um, so really, even though that the uh, there have been some personnel changes, really is considered to be, you know, the the right in the core of the classic period. Um, 
But in the blink of an eye, Wakeman was back for going for the one. Another epic, Awaken, takes up side two. And again, it's one of their best. Side one has a title track, which goes on too long. It does the gorgeous turn of the century on it. Just, just beautiful. And after a great start, that also goes on a bit too long. Uh, Parallels is very sprightly. And it's got the hit single, uh, Wondrous Stories. Um, things were about to change. It's a good album, one of my favorites, but maybe it was punk. But yes, started thinking about producing shorter songs and hit singles, but with mixed results. Now, have I got this album here? No, I haven't got it right. I haven't got it here. It's it's in my overflow room. Um, but uh, Tomato, the reason why it's not in my main listening room here is because I never play the bloody thing. Um, it, it's shorter songs, possibly the worst album cover ever. It's a shame I can't show it to you. It's kind of radio friendly, uh, may have been, but it was ultimately forgettable despite having moments. Maybe it was the influence of punk, but yes, started thinking, producing the shorter songs and chasing hit singles. And, you know, Don't Kill the Whale was a single that came off the album. And that to me sounds really childish now, but it sums up the album. It just sounds slight. Two years and big changes in the lineup. Wakeman gone again, as was Anderson this time. And then the pop band Buggles, the duo, Trevor Horn and, um, and Jeff Downs, uh, briefly joined the band for drama. Where's drama? Here we are. It's drama. And I saw Yes on this tour. I really wanted to see Yes with John Anderson, but never got around to seeing them, but did see them on this tour in Newcastle. Um, Horn, to me, I mean, this is a good album, by the way. Horn did a great job in mimicking Anderson's high pitch, and Downs was a competent replacement for the always over-elaborating Wakeman. Solid album, stood the test of time. But the live shows, and I do remember this, live shows were blighted by Anderson-loving zealots throughout, and Horn took a lot of stick from sections of the crowd. I can't remember with, whether there were boos, whether he was trying to get the certain notes and he, he just he just didn't quite have the range of Anderson and there was disgruntlement. You could just, it was tangible in the crowd. Um, so, and also that these solo pieces, the, uh, the shows to me, they had you know, climaxes here or there and everywhere. Fantastic, epic songs, but they had to have these long bass solos or drum solos. And it's just like, what? And it just didn't have the coherence of um, Genesis. But uh, anyway, still good though, still good. But nevertheless, this was a good album. And then, uh, what have I got here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so here we go. How went off, how left after this album, and to co found Asia. And then, as a guitarist, Trevor Rabin came in for 90125. Anderson was coaxed back and yes, embraced fully the MTV age and produced an album of very 80s sounding commercial songs. Owner of a Lonely Heart was the big one. I hate this album. I think it's abominable. Now, by any other band in the 80s, you could absolutely see why it was going to be. It was going to heavy rotation on FM radio and uh, and maybe MTV. Um, if MTV had been launched by this point, I can't quite remember. But it was adult oriented rock, and the guitar sound was, for me, after listening to Steve Howe, so so ordinary. Um, you know, to me, it sounds lame. Could have been an album put out by. Any one of those mediocre 80 synth band, like maybe China Crisis, were good, but nowhere near the stature of Yes. I didn't take interest in Yes after that until the half studio, half live, Keys to Ascension 1 and 2, which showed up in 1996 and 1997. So there are some other albums here. Let me just, just quickly show these, uh, these two double CDs. Now, these have got fantastic live versions of their uh, classic uh, epic tracks, but also some 
new studio tracks as well. And particularly on number two, you've got Mind Drive, which is an 18 minute classic, justifiably one of the best songs in their catalog. But these were absolutely brilliant, really, really good. Um, um, then I bought the, the Ladder, which retained the classic Yes sound and was pretty good. And much later, I hoovered up the rest in the small box. This one here, essentially, yes. So I've kind of not been interested that much, but here you've got, you still got some very, very listenable albums. Um, I think Talk is awful. I think Open Your Eyes, not, not very special. That's the, the ladder again. Uh, Magnification is good because this one is, I think, the only studio album they did where they had orchestral accompaniment of some significance. So rather than little few embellishments here and there, they really went to town with the orchestra here and it's great. It's a really good album. Don't have that one on vinyl. So um, yeah, so they were still producing stuff and still you know, going through various personnel changes. As I say, the ladder was pretty good. Quite happy with that one. Um, and I think it's, and they just kept producing live albums. I mean, they've got all these live albums, live from the House of Blues, You've got, what's this one? Live from Leon. Uh, there's a Royal Affair tour. Is that from Las Vegas? Yeah, Live from Las Vegas. And you always see pretty much the same tracks. So when you distill Yes's vast catalog down into, say, a dozen tracks, you will, you will find Yours is No Disgrace. You'll find And You and I, Close to the Edge, Awaken. Um, I've seen All Good People, Roundabouts, and a handful of others as well. So they were still producing stuff. I once had a, um, a ticket to see them when they, I think John Anderson was back in the fold and uh, they had to cut, they were, they were, the night I was seeing them, the night before I was seeing them, they were playing in Dublin in, in, uh, in Ireland and there was an overnight storm and they couldn't get all this, the stage mu musical equipment across the Irish Sea to the UK. So they had to cancel the gig. So I never actually saw them. Um, with the best best possible lineup, as it were. So the band's still going. And uh, in recent years, they've released an album called Heaven and Earth, which is sitting on CD down there, which is not bad. Um, these two are pretty good. The Quest, released in 2021. Um, I said on another video that the opening track, The Ice Bridge, is a bit of a sweet classic line, uh, classic yes. Uh, but the rest of it is, uh, you know, kind of pleasant, um, a bit more pedestrian, the shorter songs. And I think the singer uh, does a brilliant job, uh, John Davison. Um, but it's pretty good. And then th that was followed up with um, 2023's Mirror to the Sky. And it's another good album. Um, it's a bit slight. I mean, it's got side C is eight minutes long and as is uh, side D. So I don't know what they, what they were doing there, but, but it's interesting. It's good. It's pleasant. Um, it's not going to challenge the classic uh, albums. Um, so if there's a fire, um, this is not the album I'm going to pick. Uh, I'm going to grab and run with, um, but it's not bad. These aren't bad. So if you're, you know, hardcore yes fans will soak up everything. And they will, uh, they will, they'll be getting a lot out of these uh, two most recent albums. That's for sure. Um, so, uh, so there we are. Um, so let's come back to the question: Is who is the most important musician within Yes? And in my judgment, that is guitarist Steve Howe. Um, when I was younger, John Anderson's vocals meant a lot, but John Davison does a brilliant job, and he, you know, even Trevor Horn did a great job back in the early eighties. Um, in uh, replicating that 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 high tone voice, um, Wakeman, as I say, uh, fairly easily replaced uh, in, in my judgment. Uh, I think his successors tend to play fewer notes, but still do a really really nice job. Uh, Alan White was a great drummer. Bill Bruford was on a on another level, but for what what they would for what yes were putting out, uh, Alan White was still uh, perfectly good. Chris Wire's bass guitar, very, very distinctive, as I've said. Um, but again, um, I think on these later two albums, it's um, 
it's uh, Billy Sherwood uh, here who plays the bass guitar, uh, and he plays it again in that uh, in that same tone as Chris Squire, and it sounds really really good. But there's something about Steve Howe's guitar playing, and he's not my favorite guitar player by any stretch of the imagination. But there's something about his playing that is really distinctive, and distinctively yes. And he's carrying the flame uh, for the band, and it's just a—it's remarkable that he's still got that creative energy to still push out albums right up to the present day. So, kudos to him, and kudos to the rest of them for keep going. Uh, so. What album would I grab if there was a fire? And it's this one. It's the Stephen Wilson remixes, which is the Yes album, Fragile, Close to the Edge, Tales from Topographic Oceans, and Relay. So, no, I can't pick that, can I? Because it's got fire albums. No, the album I'm going to go for, it will come as no surprise. I really wanted to go for Tales for, from Topographic Oceans because I think it is remarkable but it's close to the edge. Uh, and probably like most of you out there who are Yes fans, this is the album you would grab. So there you go. That's me talking about Yes, finally getting this video done, finally giving myself permission not to listen to Yes for a few more months and give myself a bit of a Yes rest, as it were. So um, I don't know who's going to be the next one in this series, but uh, stay tuned and... Uh, if you've got this far, thanks. And uh, please leave a comment, disagree with me, um, whatever. And uh, I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching anyway. Bye for now.